नारायण नमस्कृत चान राम चैवनोरोतम देव सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीर चे नस्तप्रेशु भद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत सेवया भागवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर भविति नाइष्टिकि हरे कृष्णा ग्रंथराशि मत भागवतम तो आई लाइक टू थैंक यू everyone for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak a little something on the glorious pastimes of uh, Lord Krishna as beautifully described in the all uh, opulent all beautiful uh, narration of the supreme personality of God it shrimad bhagavatam uh this is the uh um the uh, the great gift of chaitanya mahaprabhu and all of his followers uh, the uh, full vision of transcendental pastimes of the lord as manifested in shrimad bhagavatam and beautifully delivered through the parampara by the migration of prabhupada his great great gift to the world nigamad kalpataro garitam phalam eh, the great ripened fruit of the entire vedic literature so in this beautiful chapter actually i have to say i i feel very unworthy <laughs> to be able to uh, uh you know, address such a nice assembly of uh, very wonderful exalted vaishnavas but i am feeling very very um, grateful to be with you and to be able to have this wonderful association uh, i'm very very impressed by this beautiful beautiful temple it is like a showcase of the highest standard of krishna consciousness it's so nice you know one of the great great uh, success stories of our movement uh my very my very dear son dom davra gopal das actually he, he he took a shelter right on swami when he first met him in 2004 in western canada and eventually somehow krishna arranged that he came to india so he would come visit here very very frequently as as many times as he could from his sanskrit ashram in gorana and he would give me all these wonderful reports how wonderful uh, a uh, so wonderful association he was getting here and he was feeling so inspired and so uh uh filled up with uh, everyone's uh, sincere enthusiasm and he was really really uh, treasuring every every moment every day he could spend here so it's been a long time coming for me that i finally made my <laughs> my uh, effort to come here and and get, gain your wonderful association so i'd like to thank all of you this is such a wonderful uh, example of a uh, very high level of krishna consciousness this is this community is a beautiful finely tuned uh manifestation of uh prabhupad's gifts to the world eh and vaishnav sangha krishna katha uh, the b- most beautiful sublime you know gorgeous deity worship it's so it's so captivating so wonderful such devotion is there anyway everything is so sublime here so i'm feel very indebted <laughs> thank you okay so we'll uh, continue today's verses text 8 uh, of this 10th canto chapter 38 <clears throat> okay yad architam yad architam brahma bavadibi Surai, Shriya, Cha Devya, Munibi, Sasatvatahai, Go Charanare, Anuchares, Charanara, Anuchares, Charad, Vani, Yad Gobikanam. Kucha kunku mankitam Yad architam brahma bavadi bisurai Kitam brahma bavadi bisurai Shri acha devya muni bisvasadvitai Asadvitai gocharanayan ucharais charadvane
Yacharanayasaraisaradvane Yat Gopikanam Kucha Kum Kumankitam Yachitam Brahma Babadi Bisurai Chitam Brahma Babadi Bisurai Yad Gopika Nam Kucha Kum Kum Ankitam Yad Arjitam Brahma Bhavadi Bhishurai Yad Arjitam Brahma Kucharanaya sasare charadvane Yagopikanam kucha kum kum ankitam Anyone else? Or Matajis? Anyone? Okay. Um, yat. yat. In which lotus feet? Architam. What would that mean? Worship. Yes, worship. Nice. Worshipped. Brahma Baba. By Brahma and Shiva. Adibi. And other. Surai. Who? Demigods, yes. Shriya. By Shri. Uh, probably uh, the goddess of fortune. I know we, we shall see. Uh, cha, cha, also, also. Devya, Devya, the goddess of fortune. fortune. Muni B, sages, yes. Sasadvatai, along with the devotees. Along with the devotees. Go, Go. Oh, so. cows, yes. <laughs> Charanaya. For tending, Anucharai, together with his companions, Charat, moving about, Vani, yes, in the forest. Just we were chanting in a Jairada Marava, Kunjabihari, etc. Yat, which, Gopikanam. That means the very young carrot girls, yes. Gopi or Gopika means the youngest of the coward girls. Kucha, from the breasts. Kunkum, by the red kunkum powder. Ankitam, marked. Translation, those lotus feet, a crew is meditating on Krishna. He's, he's, he's getting himself ready, you know, to, to meet the Lord at last. And he's so uh, eager and he's so uh, excited about it, you know. So he's thinking of all the beautiful features of the Lord. He's meditating in that wonderful way. Um, so here, here are the thoughts of Rakura. Those lotus feet are worshipped by Brahma, Shiva, and all the other demigods, by the goddess of fortune, and also by the great sages and Vaishnavas. Upon those lotus feet, the Lord walks about the forest while herding the cows with his companions. And those feet are smeared with the kunkum from the gopi's breasts. So I'll, I'll read the next. There's no purport to this verse, and I'll continue with the next verse, and then there's a small purport. Draksyami nanam kapola nasikam Smitava karuna kanja lokanam mukam mukam dasya gundalaksh 
kabritam pradakshinam me pracharanti vaimlika. Surely I shall see the face of Lord Mukunda, since the deer are now walking past me on my right. That face, framed by his curly hair, there's a name of Krishna uh, describing him with the curly hair. What is that? <coughs> hey? Yes, also Lord Keshava, he who has the beautiful curly hair. It's very nice. Very personal. <laughs> All of Krishna's names are so personal and specific. So that face, framed by his curly hair, is beautified by his attracted cheeks and nose, his smiling glances, and his reddish lotus eyes. Such a nice description. It's just a nice meditation of Akura. So appropriate by Srila Prabhupada. Akura saw an auspicious omen, the passing of the deer on his right, and thus he felt sure he would see the Supreme Lord Krishna. So it's a nice little detail, eh? Akura is, is very observant and he's thinking of Krishna, and then he notices there's a nice deer coming. And uh, it seems to be a small detail, not so important. But there's, uh, there's always a lot of significance in all these nice descriptions, eh? And that uh, Krishna enjoys the association of his devotees who take, up, who take on so many beautiful forms. When Krishna descends in this world, he descends with all of his entourage, his paraphernalia. Prabhupada sometimes described it as a transcendental roadshow. <laughs> like he, you know, Krishna brought the whole of Goloka Vrindavan with him, at least the main associates. Of course, there are innumerable levy entities in that supreme abode of the Lord. But those parishads, those inner, the inner circle of Krishna's lila, they came with Krishna. Yeah? Why? Because... That is the essence of God's nature that he wants to enjoy with those dear to him. That's the essence of God. There was a nice story, actually, that once Srila Prabhupada, he was going through this, either a temple or someplace, and there was a nice large painting of Krishna. And he, he stopped in front of it, he was looking, then the devotees were, were, were wondering, a few Prabhupada's disciples were with him, and they were saying, oh, Prabhupada, very nice painting of Krishna. And Prabhupada was looking. He says, no, that is not Krishna. And the devotees, but Prabhupada, Krishna is there. Prabhupada said, no, Krishna is never alone. Because that painting showed only Krishna standing there without any, anyone or anything around him. And Prabhupada said, no, that is not Krishna. Because Krishna is never alone. Krishna is always enjoying with his, his wonderful associates. And that is the essence of God's nature. That was nicely described by Lord Chaitanya. When he went to Benares and converted, well, actually, the whole of Benares got swept in to the uh, waves of uh, the Prema Niketanam, uh, like uh, the whole ocean of love of God, it was wherever Lord Chaitanya went. He brought it with him. You know? So he flooded the whole of India wherever he went. And he, went, he entered into Benares, which is the headquarters of the Mayavadi, the followers of Shankaracharya, very proud and scholarly like that. So he entered into Benares and he simply performed Harinam Sankirtan. And he flooded the entire Benares with the you know, flood of love of Godhead. And the whole of Benares became filled with spiritual love and spiritual ecstasy. You know, he just swept everyone along into that. And finally, it came to the attention of the great uh, leader of that community, Prakasananda, Saraswati, very, very elevated or learned, you know, Mayavad uh, leader, and he invited Lord Chaitanya to come. And Lord Chaitanya, he, uh, he, uh, he was manifesting different features, but he showed his extreme humility when he finally, at first he was not so sure, but of course he wanted to go and convert and give his mercy to Prakasananda and all of his followers, but um, he finally arrived in the, near the assembly hall where all these uh, great, you know, austere sannyasis were, and he stood there where they were leaving their shoes, eh? He stood there. But he had this divine light, this his divine duty, his divine effulgence coming from him, and it was flooding the whole area. <laughs> it was just beautiful. And Everyone became quite amazed. Oh, what is this person that he's got? So much light is coming from him. But finally, uh, 
he was able to have a discussion with Prakasananda Saraswati where he demonstrated that the philosophy of Shankaracharya was very incomplete because it was like uh, Kivalya, everything is one and uh, uh, Nirguna Brahman, that the supreme truth is this formless uh, Brahman that has no qualities, uh, Nirguna, no variety, no qualities, therefore it is indescribable. It's beyond words, it's beyond our conception, like that. And Lord Chaitanya says that is not the full understanding. Because Brahman is saguna. It is full of all transcendental variegatedness. So much variety. Because that is God's nature. He enjoys through variety. He has innumerable energies. Parasashaktir vividesha shuyati. Everything is coming from him. In order to, for him to display his different potencies and enjoy that. That variety of energy. That Krishna's essential nature. Therefore, Krishna is never alone. Krishna is always surrounded by his devotees. And in fact, he, though he's the Shakti Man, he is the source of everything and of everyone, he would rather uh, be on the equal or inferior level of his devotees. He, he, he wants to enjoy Rasa. And Krishna's name is uh, Rasa Bihari or Rasa Raj. Anyway, Rasa Bihari, he who enjoys unlimited varieties of flavors of love. You know? And so uh, he uh, allows his devotee to very, be very close and intimate in order to exchange that beautiful, intimate, divine, uh, loving exchange. Yeah? And that was, this, that was unknown. Even in the Vedas, it is hinted, but very briefly, only here and there. Uh, and that full rasa tattva, that f- the, those full truths about the varieties of divine love, prema vilas, of God's loving pastimes in the spiritual world, was revealed through Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He empowered his followers to give that highest revelation, that full description of God's personhood, that God is the supreme person. Uh, um, Ishvara Paramakrishna, Satchitananda Vigraha, and Adir, Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam, uh, that he is the original and the source, but he is uh, full of rasa, of, of varieties of love. And, that, and he especially empowered his most uh, intimate follower, Srila Rupa Goswami, to, uh, he instructed him personally in uh, Prayag. Yeah? And when, when Ruba Ruba had been traveling all around India searching after Lord Chaitanya and finally they met in this wonderful, glorious meeting in Prayag or Allahabad at the confluence of the tree Veni. And from a distance, Rupa Goswami was able to see Lord Chaitanya leading his, his beautiful Harinam, surrounded by thousands of ecstatic chanters. And from a distance, Rupa Goswami finally had the darshan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his most glorious feature, you know, glorifying the holy name. And for, he fell like a danda, boom, in front or at, at the sight of Lord Chaitanya. And from the core of his heart, he, he recited this beautiful prayer. Namo Mahabandanaya, Krishna Prema Pridayati, Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namni Gorotisve Namaha. Such a perfect beautiful description of Lord Chaitanya as the most magnanimous of all incarnations because he was giving to everyone without any material qualification, any previous pious activity, he was giving them access to the highest divine love of God, which is inconceivably great and such a, it's called Odariya. The, the Lord Chaitanya came with the, simply the mood of Radharani to give, give, give Krishna to everyone. And he was able to do that and enter into the heart of everyone and grab their, their affection and, and arouse their, their attraction for Krishna. So um, Lord Chaitanya finally, um, after uh, meeting with Rupa Goswami, he instructed them into the deep, uh, somewhat esoteric truths of uh, prema, of divine love, and all of his varieties and intricacies, you know, rasa tattva, and Rupa Goswami in, gave that same revelation in his glorious books, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, Upadesha Amrita, and Ujwala Nilamani, and there's a few other literatures, which are, uh, at least Srila Prabhupada has given us that 
most important of literatures, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which is so amazing and glorious. You know? It describes the different processes of devotional service and, and the different manifestations of the awakening of one's dormant relationship with Krishna you know, in different stages. And finally goes into the details of all the aesthetic uh, symptoms and all sorts of beautiful loving exchanges with Krishna. It's, it's so glorious. And Prabhupada called that book the law book of, Ma- of uh, Iskon. And, uh, but it's simply uh, full of nectar. <laughs> and that's the business of the devotees, is to seek that nectar and to share that nectar. And that brings me to uh, Prabhupada's um, own uh, uh, mission or how he was so successful. Because um, as a pure lover of, of Krishna, uh, Srila Prabhupada, was uh, he had that burning, burning desire coming down from his guru. He, he always gave all credit to his guru. Oh, my guru has made everything happen. I'm simply trying to follow him somehow or other. But uh, these are great, eternal, perfect beings coming down from Lord Chaitanya's inner circle, coming to this world to do Lord Chaitanya's work of saving the world, saving all us, uh, all, all the the souls uh, re- rebellious against Krishna, you know, who've, uh, who've forgotten everything about their real identity and like that, lost in the ways of illusion. But Lord Chaitanya sent his greatest uh, and most uh, loving servants to do his work and, and bring us back to, to, to Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada, he, um, he got that burning desire from his guru to, to go and give or try the impossible to give Krishna to the whole world, even to those who didn't want anything to do with it. And, and Prabhupada was so successful because he was a lover of God, a lover of Krishna. And he would uh, uh, try anything. He, he was ready for any, any, any difficulty or austerity because he, he trusted in Krishna. He knew, well, Krishna will take care if I have some success, it is all his mercy. If I don't have success, that's also his mercy. Whatever he wants, I, I, I will do his, you know, his will. And that's a really beautiful expression in Prabhupada's poem there in the uh, Markana Bhagavat. Uh, you know, like he wrote on the Jaladuta as he was sitting in the harbor, Boston Harbor. Eh? And, and that poem Prabhupada never actually... Uh, shared with us until Prabhupada left and it was discovered eh, in his diary, I believe. eh? Because we never knew of it when Prabhupada was with us. And shortly after his departure, then it it was revealed to us, this amazing poetry of of total uh, surrender to Krishna's will and and Prabhupada stating, you know, you brought me here to this place and these persons or these souls are so lost and they're so covered uh, and you, it is your desire to save them, but I feel very incapable and unworthy of trying that. But if you want, let your will be done. Like uh, you may use me if you want, as you wish. And he, he said this beautiful phrase. He said, uh, "You are my master, and under your perfect guidance, let me dance. Let me dance. You know, let me dance under your perfect control." And that was Prabhupada's perfection, that he was uh, so surrendered to Krishna's uh, mission and Krishna's desire that Krishna worked through him. He worked miracles upon miracles. And it was seen that Prabhupada was able to uh, give that same urgent desire to help everyone to his own followers. He was uh, an ocean of compassion. But he was able to transform those who came in contact with him to also become very compassionate and uh, very saintly persons. It's amazing. I mean, uh, basically, uh, most of us, if not all of us, had, uh, we were very unqualified <laughs> to uh, become Prabhupada's disciples. Um, and, you know, but somehow or other, we were blessed with some attraction, some appreciation, some eagerness to hear from Prabhupada. And then everything else was done. As soon as we were able to hear the truth coming from Prabhupada's perfect realizations, his 
his, his Krishna Shakti, eh? Krishna Shakti Vinana Hi Ta Pravartana, it says eh? that the, unless one is empowered by Krishna, he cannot give Krishna to others. That divine force comes and incarnates. Krishna incarnates in the heart and on the lips of his pure devotees. And that sound is Shabda Brahman. It is God in sound. He is there in his holy name and he's there on the lips of his pure devotees. And that, that becomes manifest in this world as Shastra. Shastra is the empowered utterances of Krishna's perfect servants. Brahma, Vyasadev, coming down to the Parampara, and Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Vinod Swami. These are all spokesmen of God. God speaks through them. Therefore, everything they have given to the world, that is Shastra. You know? And it, it is still going on. The empowerment that Krishna gives to his devotees didn't stop with Srila Prabhupada. He empowered others to do the same. And on different degrees. Prabhupada's empowerment is, is unique, as was his own guru, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So that brings me back to the uh, point that our only qualification was that we were somehow blessed to be able to hear Prabhupada. And that created a huge revolution in our whole uh, existence. You know, our whole mindset totally changed that we were wasting our lives in these useless stuff, and sense gratification, whatever. And we sort of lost those interests and we became interested in what Prabhupada was, was into, that is, giving Krishna to the whole world. <laughs> and that huge transformation, it was like miraculous the way it, it happened, and so quite, quite quickly also. And that was our only qualification, that we were able to hear Prabhupada and take it somewhat seriously. It had the effect because we were eager to hear that perfect message, and it had a perfect effect on us. There's a nice story, actually, that once... Uh, Shudra Prabhupada, he was actually with one of his god brothers. It could have been Mayapur. And this is after many years of you know, when Prabhupada returned to India, uh, end of 1970, early 71, with his uh, 51st uh, group of Western disciples. He, he was like, he made a sensation wherever he went. The first time in history that Westerners had become Vaishnavas, eh? And uh, it was like miraculous and un ever, never before seen. So it was quite a sensation when Prabhupada came. And he was actually known as the, the guru of the hippies. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> we were like lost souls, hippies, whatever. But Prabhupada made it into Vaishnavas. You know? And so, but we were still uh, tainted. We were, we were sincere and trying our best to follow Prabhupada's perfect teachings, giving our best efforts. But we had many uh, residual bad qualities. You know, like, you know, like in other words, not so cultured, not so refined in our nature. And so one of Prabhupada's god brothers, he was discussing with Prabhupada, and I guess he had a, quite a good connection to him because he just revealed his mind to Prabhupada. He said, yes, your disciples, they're very sincere, but they have no, no understanding of, Vai of Vaishnav etiquette. They, they are, they're behaving sometimes not so nice. And Prabhupada, he said, well, I can only say that that can be perhaps the, the fact. They are lacking in Vaishnava etiquette, you know, in that culture, but they have one good quality. So his God brother said, yes. So what is, what is that? Prabhupada said, whatever I say, they will always do. They follow every word. Whatever I, I instruct them, they're ready to do that. And that is their one great quality. Whatever else, it's, it does, it's not, not important. So we're not so refined and not so cultured, and we don't really know about Vaishnava etiquette. Well, that has evolved. That has much improved, <laughs> fortunately. But the most important thing is if you take the words of your guru seriously, and Prabhupada said about himself that my only qualification 
was that I took to heart every word of my guru. And once he told some of his followers during the morning walk, he says, because I was so eager to hear my Guru Maharaj, every time I could, I was always trying to hear from him. So because I took it so seriously and I was so eager, you know, for hearing, now I'm very eager to, to share the same message, to preach everywhere around the world. And then he, said, he told uh, his disciples, you also become like that. Eager to hear. And it was a very famous statement eh, of Bhakti Siddhanta that he said that, uh, oh, Abhay Charan, he's very nice. I've marked him. He likes to hear. And there was a fam famous episode where uh, Bhakti Siddhanta went uh, with hundreds, if not thousands, of his disciples on a big pilgrimage around the greater Braj Mandal. And they were at uh, Koshi, this Koshi. And there was a camp there, and they settled. And, and they, the announcement was made that this, tomorrow we are going to a very famous temple, and, you know, a very historical famous temple. And so the majority of his disciples went off to visit that famous temple. But Prabhupada was one of the few that stayed front row center, like right there in front of his guru, to hear every word. And Paksiranta noticed that. The eagerness to hear, which means the eagerness to follow, to take it seriously and to apply that. And so uh, that's Prabhupada. He, he claimed at the end of his life, one of his godbrothers came and said, oh, you have done... Finally, there was acknowledgement, reciprocation from some of his friendly godbrothers. Oh, you have done the impossible. You have done uh, miracles. You have spread Harinam all around the world. It is so glorious. And Prabhupada was like one month before he actually departed. He was lying, you know, like half paralyzed. But Prabhupada said, no, uh, I have no real credit. It is Guru Maharaj, or, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta, who, is, who has done through me. But I'm, I'm proud to say that whatever he said, I followed blindly. So Prabhupada took that as his only qualification, that he would blindly follow his guru. And he told us many times like that. He said, I have unlimited trust in my guru. I am following him blindly. He told me, if you get money, print books. Therefore, I'm asking all of you, you print books, you print books, you print books. And now look, it's so nice here. Eh? Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, 45 different editions, all around the world. That, was, that is the... Result of perfect Guru Nishta. That because Srila Prabhupada had so much faith in his Guru, he became so empowered to spread the message of Lord Krishna all around the world. Through his own followers, he empowered everyone. And the empowerment is still going on. It's not just our, our generation of Prabhupada disciples. The empowerment uh, is going on because that is Krishna's desire. He wants to empower as many of his, this, uh, of his devotees. You know, that's what gives Krishna the greatest satisfaction and pleasure. He wants to work through his, his servants, through his devotees. You know? And that was Prabhupada's also greatness that he, he saw us. who were very unworthy, uncultured, very fallen but he saw us as very, very nice devotees. And he treated us with, you know, with the greatest love and care as Krishna's special family members. You know? That's how Prabhupada saw us. That's how Prabhupada saw the whole world, actually. Not just his own disciples. That's the vision of a perfect soul, a lover of God. He sees everyone else as a, a part of God. You know? He wants to give that connection to everyone. You know? We've, we've thrown away that connection. We think we can be happy without God, without Krishna. But the pure devotee, he, they bring us out of that illusion. Come back. You belong to Krishna. You're, you're, you can be with Krishna again. Like that. So Prabhupada was very eager to, uh, 
uh, reciprocate with those who came and took shelter of him, you know. And uh, he gave so much mercy, so much shelter, and he's still doing that. That shelter is available. It's called the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON. And uh, now growing, like, wow, expanding. It's so glorious to see that, you know, 600 temples and centers around the world, and things are, are, are manifesting so gloriously here in India. And I'm so impressed by this jewel of a temple. It is such a showcase. It's, it's a perfect manifestation of the highest level of Krishna consciousness. It's so glorious, you know, and you're so fortunate, and you're very uh, sincere to, to uh, represent Prabhupada like that, you know. Prabhupada is so uh, uh, present here. You can experience that. You know, that uh, he is giving shelter to the whole world, and this is one beautiful uh, arena, place, where Bombay is taking shelter. <laughs> the cream of Bombay, the best souls of Bombay can come here and bathe in the beauty of Lord Krishna and the glory of his love. In the, in the beauty and love of his uh, perfect servants, his pure devotees like Prabhupada, and all the other saints that Prabhupada has, has, has given to the world. So many, so many. Uh, I myself, uh, I, I've, I've remained in, in Iskand. I was a little bit uh, on the outskirts of Iskand when my children were growing up. But anyway, <laughs> my son actually brought me back. <laughs> And um, so, um, but my life has been very exciting. I'm, I'm a, a happy nobody in the sense I, I never wanted to make a big, uh, a big wave or a big, but uh, I think I've had the most beautiful and blessed life because I was able to be a witness to this great miracle. Just one of so many witnesses to the miracle of the spreading of the Sankirtan movement around the world through the empowered uh, teachings and, and uh, efforts of such a great, 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 inconceivable personality as Srila Prabhupada. You know? and, uh, and that demonstration of God's love for the world, that he sends these great souls, uh, that has made all of your lives so significant and fulfilling and exciting because there's like there's so much uh, rewarding and, and satisfying uh, things happening in all our lives you know and so property trained us to become like bees you know to um, to always see the good and look and search out the nectar and lose our lower nature of being like the fly trying to see what's not so good, all the faults and all the, you know, the shortcomings and the bad things. And the, that is material. We, should, we have to leave that at the door, as they say. We, you know, there's no room for that in Christian consciousness. We have to become like bees and see the wonderful, sincere qualities in every soul because of their connection to Krishna, their connection to Guru and Krishna. And we can appreciate so many wonderful souls, and that's... Krishna's blessing. Krishna's blessing takes the form of the Sangha, of the associates of, you know, that he, he gives to us. You know. If we are very sincere, Krishna gives us sincere association so we can increase our sincerity and we increase our enthusiasm and increase our taste and our enjoyment. We're supposed to be happy in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> And that is not a, a lone enterprise. It's like we can't do it on our own, alone. It is a collective achievement to become fulfilled, productive, happy in Krishna consciousness. It is a group achievement. You can, even with two, it's the beginning of a group, <laughs> and you know, it increases. It's called spiritual synergy, where the good nature, the sincerity of one person is combined with the other devotee, one plus one doesn't equal two, it becomes four and eight and twelve 
And if you add a third person, it becomes 20. Because it's spiritual mathematics. It, it's greater than the limit, limitations of this world. You know? In material affairs, one plus one only equals two. It can't go any more than that. But in spiritual things, things are so much more productive and you know, they amplify it by Krishna's mercy. So devotees are meant to share the positive, to you know, support each other, help each other, appreciate each other, and become uh, transmitters of nectar. Nectar means which gives you life, which gives you spiritual enthusiasm. Yeah. And Prabhupada has given the world uh, an army of nectar wallas, <laughs> of uh, perfect distributors of divine nectar. The Gauravani, the most amazing, perfect you know, revelation about God's personal nature and the process to connect with God. The, the immensely perfect Bhagavad Dharma, Gauravani, that is the gift that Prabhupada has, has received and transmitted to the world. And we are all, in, in, that's our family business. You know, we're nectar wallas. We're sharing the nectar. We're giving that connection to Gauravani, to everyone. Even if they only think a nice thought about devotees. Oh, he's nice. I like, I like him. He's a nice person. That is the beginning of their devotional service, of their connection. Because that will make them favorable or to maybe appreciate and, and listen better to what the devotees have to share. You know? And they can only increase. You know? So we're so blessed uh, to be able to have that connection and to bring it to anyone and everyone. Anyone and everyone. It's amazing. So my life, though it's not so significant, but it has been one of witnessing how that connection has spread in amazing ways, miraculous ways. When Prabhupada was with us, it was amazing things. Things were happening all around. My God, it was so glorious. And it was still going on. And there were maybe some mistakes and some leaders that had troubles and this, but that is part of the journey. Or, or we're, we're at war with Kali Yuga, with the forces of darkness and ignorance. So in a war, there's some even capable wars that get uh, cut down, but there's no loss or diminution. Krishna will make them rise again because the soul is eternal and devotional service connection to Krishna is eternal. There's never any loss. There, there may be uh, a, a gap in time or whatever, but that's not so important. Prabhupada always took back any disciple. So many had gone away at times, fallen back into bad habits and this and that. Prabhupada would always take them back. And he said, what's, do, what's done is done. Now you take up the process. You stay with us. You, you take up. Because everything that you have done, you, you still have it with you. And Krishna will give you the full credit and you'll pick up where you left. You'll have the desire, the enthusiasm, you know, the, the drive to keep going. To my knowledge, Prabhupada rejected only two of his thousands of disciples because they were rascals. And I'll tell you why. I don't have to name names. Devotees of my generation would know who that. One was a... Uh, actually, he did guru aparad. That is, he, he was a very intellectual person. He thought he knew so much. He, he had mastered Sanskrit and this, and, and he was always reading this and that. And after a few years, five, six years as a devotee, he even traveled with Prabhupada for a whole year as one of his assistants for the books, you know. Anyway, and he finally got so puffed up with all this, you know, the vanity of knowing so many things that he, 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 he thought, he fell prey to a great illusion, a very dangerous illusion, that uh, Srila Prabhupada is a great, great acharya, a great saint, but he has not given us everything. I think I have to learn more esoteric, higher truths from uh, another guru. So I will go and, and learn because now I'm ready. Prabhupada has made me ready. And so I, I thank him. Now I can go on to the next level. You know, beyond the PhD, like, you know, way up there. 
And he was such a fool, he even, and Prabhupada had warned him, Prabhupada could see that. Prabhupada was all-knowing in as much as Krishna would allow him to see, oh, this devotee is not in the right mentality, you know, he's, he's, he's thinking in the wrong way. Prabhupada would always correct this. In fact, Prabhupada had this superhuman ability, like an X-ray vision, you know, to understand exactly the heart of his disciples and to uh, correct them or encourage them. He could use both sides, you know. And he was always perfect instruction. In Prabhupada's letters to his disciples, it's like, you know, and the disciples were flabbergasted. How could Prabhupada know this or that? You know, I never told him. Well, Krishna's there, and Krishna tells everything to Prabhupada. So, you know, Krishna knows, and if, if Krishna wants, he'll, he'll let Prabhupada know, <laughs> which he, Prabhupada did in everything he did. He wouldn't know everything. So Prabhupada knew, and therefore he tried to correct that disciple. He told him, there's no, no, no necessity. You stay, everything is good. And you just, you know, continue. He tried to encourage him in a positive manner. And that rascal, he was such a fool. He didn't take Prabhupada's own, you know, advice. And finally the day came when he was ready to pack it up like and go and live in this other ashram, you know, under the guidance of the so-called more knowledgeable guru. And he, he had the audacity to come before Prabhupada and ask for Prabhupada's blessing. And Prabhupada knew the whole situation. Prabhupada was disgusted with him, having tried to save him, and he didn't take Prabhupada's mercy or you know, shelter. So he went before Prabhupada and he said, so I've come to ask your blessing. Prabhupada looked at him very, very sternly. He said, my blessing? You will, my blessing is that you will no longer make advancement in this life. Very heavy, very heavy. Because there was tough love. Prabhupada wanted to slap him and wake him up. That why are you so foolish? Why are you trying to waste your time and go to someone else? You know? But uh, that rascal didn't follow Prabhupada. And he, he fell away and he, that was it. <laughs> of course, he can always beg forgiveness and be admitted. You know, Prabhupada is not like, he didn't send him to hell. <laughs> But he said, you're looking for advancement? In other words, simply being in Prabhupada's servant is the greatest shelter, the greatest uh, possible advancement. There's nothing better than that, you know. You can wait a million lives before you get that opportunity to be uh, in Prabhupada's uh, shelter. Saying so, you're going to put that aside and try to find something else? Such foolishness. Anyway. And the other... Uh, uh, the other uh, example was an a, um, incorrigible a speculator. That um, one of our regulatory principles is not no cheating, no gambling, and no speculation because it's a dangerous game. If you think you can have a better idea, you can put a spin, put your own spin on anything, you know. Oh, I know what that really means. Like, you know, that, that's what my bodies and, and also uh, gyanis do. They take Krishna's words and they say, oh, Krishna, he's saying this, but actually he means something else. So it's like Prabhupada would use example in Dr. Radhakrishna's t- uh, commentary to Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, man mana ma bhakta ma mam namaskuru, that always think of me. And uh, Prabhupada said, this rascal, Ramakrishna, uh, Radhakrishna, very famous scholar, he was even the president of India in the, in the 1950s or 60s. And... Um, he, uh, he met as a commentary, when Krishna says, think of me, he actually means think of the unmanifest beyond Krishna. In other words, Brahman. In other words, a total Mayavadi distortion, misinterpretation. And Prabhupada always said, that is the rascal uh, Mayavadi mentality. They want to use Krishna. They speak from Bhagavad Gita, but totally opposite to what Krishna is saying or what Krishna means. So, so dangerous, you know, this misinterpretation. So one of Prabhupada's disciples was like that, that he would put his spin, he would, you know, oh, Prabhupada said this, but actually he means that. No, Prabhupada always spoke as it is. You know, he didn't have a hidden meaning in what he's saying. And that's the beauty of Prabhupada's books. They're so clear, they're crystal clear, and they're so enlightening. And they, they really, you know, 
make us fully understand the most impossible truths, but they're very clearly understood through Prabhupada's revelation. It's so nice, you know. I was reading so many books of many yogis before I met the devotees in Prabhupada, and everything was sort of nebulous. You never quite knew what it was about, you know. Okay, because they always said, well, it's all right. If it's, if it's spiritual, it has to be mystical, difficult to understand, way up there, you know, mystical. Prabhupada, once in one statement, Prabhupada said, there's nothing mystical in Krishna consciousness. Everything is clear, everything is revealed. You apply yourself and you can understand everything clearly. And Krishna will give you the intelligence. Prabhupada will give us the intelligence to understand everything. It says, actually, in, the, in a very beautiful verse in the Bhagavatam, Mahatseva Vimukte something, Vasudev Kataruchi, that the, uh, there is a great spiritual reward in serving the great souls like Prabhupada and the Parampara and your guru. You know, if you're connected to Prabhupada through guru, like you're serving your guru, it's as good as serving Prabhupada. It's the same connection. So by surrendering to guru and serving him with heart and soul, there's a reward available. And you should go and get your reward. And what is that reward? Vasudev Kataruchi. You get a deep taste and attraction for hearing about Krishna and an attachment to hearing about Krishna. And you want to hear more about Krishna from all the right sources, you know, from your guru and Prabhupada and everything good. You know, and you get an appreciation and a realization and attachment for that. It is so precious. In fact, it is life's greatest treasure. There's nothing more precious than your realization, your appreciation for Krishna coming through Guru Parampara. And Prabhupada has created so many glorious channels of that Vajudev uh, Kataruchi, of that, that, that eagerness, that taste for Krishna. I, I constantly listen. Besides Prabhupada's classes, I like to hear classes from a few of my godbrothers, who are some of my heroes. One of my favorites is uh, Niranjan Swami. He has such a clear, beautiful intelligence. He has understood so nicely Prabhupada's teachings, you know. He enlightens me with his beautiful realizations, you know. Uh, he has such a beautiful analytical intelligence. He can, you know, break things down and, and, and describe in very nice, wonderful, very clear buddhi, very clear spiritual understanding. It's so nice. And of course, Radha Swami, he has an empowerment for Lila Kata. For uh, um, he is the greatest storyteller in our movement. Yeah, that's that's a really beautiful gift that Krishna has given him for his lifetime of service. He's become a, 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 an ocean of nectar of Lila Kata of, of the pastimes of Krishna and of Krishna's great devotees. I mean, the first time I heard Radhanath Swami was uh, I, I knew of him and I was uh, a distant admirer of him, you know. Uh, from New Bindavan, from the early years, we, when I went uh, with many devotees in 1972 to a very great historical assembly uh, in the Janmasmi 1972, August 1972, and Prabhupada, and six, seven hundred Prabhupada disciples were there. And, sat, and uh, someone pointed out to me, oh, here's Radha, and he's a very nice devotee. He uh, takes care of some deities in a farm out on the other side of the forest. You know, a lot of austerity involved, and we were quite impressed and, and in admiration of his determination, his steadiness, like that. You know? And we could never even have tried that. I mean, we were like doing Sankatan, and there was austerity in that, but you know, doing that type of special deity worship, you know, he had totally surrendered to it, and he was totally into it, and he was a happy, dedicated soul. A beautiful example. You know, the wealth of our movement is, is very dedicated devotees like that. And so uh, there was a, a, but I didn't have a chance to this, uh, meet him and talk to him like that. Anyway, but through the years, I, I had a few infrequent kind of, uh, encounters with him. It was all right. But in the summer of 2004, he visited uh, Saranagiri at the invitation of Mother Jamuna. And I, I was formerly uh, living there uh, back in the Vancouver Temple. And when we heard, well, Radhanath Kwan is coming to Saranagiri, so that was like a three-hour, four-hour journey, we went. We spent the, the week there, and every day, Radhanat Maharaj would uh, share beautiful stories, especially on Naratam Das Thakur, 
And we had heard some of those stories, which I had read in one of our books, and it was very nice. But he had the expanded version. You know, he spoke on that beautiful, uh, the very famous, the first Gorpurnim festival, which it was organized, especially by Narayana Sandas Thakur, Keturi Gram. And it was a very elaborate pastime. And he spoke on it for two days, three hours one day and, and four hours the next day. <laughs> and he had such detail. I was like flabbergasted. Wow, how can he knows that much? You know, all the intricate details. And that's as if he had been sent there and, <laughs> and picked it all up and, and gave us a report, you know. <laughs> wow, how can he know all that? You know, so much information. And uh, all the names of the deities that were installed in that festival, and the, the, the history of each deity, because the deity, deity was, one deity was brought here and the other deity was brought there, and it was like a whole intricate history which he, he wove into the story. You know? So he has this amazing Shakti for telling amazing stories, and it's not imaginary, it's all authentic, perfect narrations from perfect sources, and he's got it all there, you know, <laughs> in his beautiful brain, you know. <laughs> Anyway, so that's the reward <coughs> for uh, giving your life to the Sangatam movement. And I have other uh, glorious god brothers and some god sisters. One, Vishaka. Vishaka is such a saint. I think she's been here a few times. Eh? Such a clear intelligence. Such a good uh, capacity for communication. She, when she speaks, everything is nice and clear. And, and she draws a whole picture. You know, she's the, one of the most gifted writers She's written a hundred articles in Back to Godhead over the last 40 years. Eh? Everything is so nice. So she is a one glorious demonstration of Prabhupada's empowerment to all of his disciples, men and women. You know? And there are many, many great souls like that. Yeah. I think I've, yeah, I've gone beyond the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just like to glorify my, my God brothers. But <laughs> Yes. And especially your glorification of Srila Prabhupada's disciples. Yeah. Um, something I thought about while you were talking so nicely about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, how Prabhupada gave him all credit. Yeah. And um, one of the instances where Prabhupada uh, gave him also more credit was he said on several different occasions that my Guru Maharaj. He said this in Atlanta, and he actually broke down in tears. My Guru Maharaj has sent you all Very nice. to assist me. Mm. So um, I had this I thought, uh, question mm. while you were talking. Mm. Uh, okay, so we, we all know, like you were saying, we, all of us were so degraded. And we had no pious credits. I think someone once said Prabhupada made our pious credits. Yeah. So, I mean, can you maybe speak a little bit about mm. how, mm. what Prabhupada was meaning when he said, like, Bhakti Siddhanta had sent us? I mean, did Bhakti mm -hmm. Siddhanta somehow, I don't know. <laughs> I know, it's a mysterious statement. You know, who are we that Bhakti Siddhanta would send us to Prabhupada? Prabhupada is like a spiritual giant. We're like little ants next to Prabhupada. What can an ant understand of the elephant, you know, <laughs> in a sense that. But uh, Bhakti Siddhanta, he was very, very powerful uh, a servant of Lord Chaitanya, you know, a world savior, basically. And um, yeah, he, t he totally, Vaishnavism, the Gaur Gauravani or the Gaudiya Vaishnav legacy of Lord Chaitanya was all but dead before Bhakti Thakur came. There were a few saintly Babaji's on the you know, unknown, living in the little holy places, but basically the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition had become so degraded, so distorted, it, it, it was totally lost. And Bhakti Thakur, he brought it all back, and especially he trained his son, and his son went on a uh, military campaign. He went to destroy all the Appa Sampradayas uh, you know, without any uh, mercy or <laughs> any uh, any... You know, okay, you're concocting, you're distorting Lord Chaitanya, you're a rascal and a fool, and you give it up, or <laughs> singa guru, eh? like the, the lion on the hunt, you know, devouring the mayavads and the concocted sajiyas, like that, you know, totally 
and he, they had no leg to stand on. They, they would run away sometimes. It became like that. Oh, this Bhakti Siddhartha's coming. Okay, let's get out of here. <laughs> He's going to really chew us up and spit us out, you know. <laughs> he was very powerful like that. So he did that, and Prabhupada was very proud of, of that. He told us many times, he said, my Guru Maharaj, he was ready to, you know, take on anyone, uh, including uh, Ramakrishna and so many nonsense, you know, anyway. Everywhere he went, he was a conqueror for Krishna. And he had to do it. He had to do, like, he had to cut through the jungle of the Mayavad and the concocted Apasampradayas to get to the effulgent pure Gauravani so that he would show, uh, uh, manifest it in all of its glory. So he had to cut down all the, the bad stuff in order for it to, to rise again. So Prabhupada continued that and he brought it to the West. And Prabhupada was also a fighter, uh, you know, like really, he didn't uh, back down at anything. And like here, there was a famous episode where Prabhupada came and gave the, the Pandal in Calcutta in 71 or something, and there was a group of uh, what they would call today terrorists, that is, they're fanatical revolutionaries called Na the Naxalites. And these were armed, and uh, they would uh, kill uh, some of their targets, like uh, they were after very rich men, because these person said, well, the only way that people can be helped is through violent re revolution. You know, they claimed like communist roots and like that, uh, Lenin and, and, and Maoist and whatever. And uh, there was just a bunch of crazy revolutionaries. And uh, so they sent a message uh, to Prabhupada, uh, it, you know, don't come or, 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 or die. You know, they wanted to challenge because they felt, oh, religion is a opium of the people, like the, the communist slogan, eh? You know, and so a uh, great religious leader like Prabhupada, they felt, oh, he's the enemy, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get at him. So they said, you know, okay, stop or, or die. And Prabhupada, no, no problem. He went, and in fact, uh, after a few days, some of those crazy revolutionaries showed up, and they tried to make trouble, you know, and, but the devotees uh, didn't, uh, didn't want to mess with them. They didn't want to start any fight. Um, they just asked him, well, you can, you can sit here. And they asked, okay, we want to sit up front. And, you know, we, we can shout if we want. And they thought they would uh, heckle, like they would shout against Prabhupada. But when they came to the front and, and listened to Prabhupada, they're, you know, they had nothing to say. They could recognize, here is a really genuine person. And he's a friend of the people. He really wants to help everyone. Uh, well, what can we say, you know? So they became very docile in front of Prabhupada, these Hardcore revolutionaries, ready to kill people, all that. And in front of Prabhupada, they became like little kittens, not roaring, but <laughs> very submissive. So Prabhupada's Shakti was amazing like that. And he was fearless, Abai, fearless for Krishna, time and again. And he made his disciples fearless, really. Like, you know, and so many disciples went to the far corners of the world, into Russia, and here and there, and their lives were at stake, but no, nothing will stop them. And look at what happened to the Russian devotees. They were being arrested and tortured by the state police, the KGB, and they didn't stop. You know, I've often wondered what I have been a devotee in those circumstances. You know, like you're you're going to be arrested and tortured if they if you're found. <laughs> you know, what what determination, what fearlessness? The Prabhupada created the, that divine fire. You know, in the in those in those souls. You know, anything for Krishna. So it's, it's so glorious. Our legacy is amazing. Right? Amazing. So thank you very much. Jagat Guru Shura Prabhupada ki jai. Radha Govinath Mandir ki jai. Guru Parampara ki jai. Go Brahmananda Hari Gaur. Thank you. That's all. Hare Krishna. Prabhupada's mercy ki jai.